that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We'll rejoice, we'll rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We'll rejoice, we'll rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, every day in the Lord is a great day. Amen. Man, it's great to worship with you, whether you're in this place or joining us online. Welcome to the Lord's house. What, what a better place to be. I can't think of anything better than to just be able to worship with brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, it's a great way to recharge. You know, there's so many things going on this week in your life, but I know there's a lot going on here at church as well. Just a few highlights for you. I've been doing a lot of driving lately, so I have my long distance contacts in, but it means I can't read this piece of paper. There we go. Uh, this next Saturday, there's a men's fellowship breakfast here at the church. Be sure to sign up for that. Let, let the uh, leaders know that you're going to be here for that and be a part of that time of connection and fellowship with the guys. And they wanted to do that because, ladies, you're going to be meeting at Scoop Du Jour, and you're going to be doing the thrift store crawl. So both have plans. The guys couldn't be outdone. They're doing breakfast and sitting and enjoying it. The ladies are going to be running all over shopping. So uh, it'll be a great week. If you're a part of small groups coming up on May 21st, we're going to have a fellowship luncheon for all those that have been in small groups. We want to be sure to draw you together as we bring this spring session to a close. VBS coming up quickly. They had a leaders meeting last week. If you can help with that, there's uh, uh, donations, there's sign-up sheets, all kinds of things we need for that. If you have any questions about VBS, see Stephanie Bolt, uh, and she will have those uh, answers for you. First Impressions team uh, is still looking for volunteers. You can be sure to be a part of that. As well, if you have a graduate in your family, be sure to let the church office know this week. We, we've got our uh, crossover uh, ceremony. We just our honors week uh, coming up in June. We want to be sure to get all of the graduates included. Uh, it's par that's called Promotion Sunday. That's what that says. Uh, Promotion Sunday, which is June 4th. So we want to get that covered. And then VBS I mentioned, but the dates are in the bulletin. And all of those things. I went fast. I talked fast. It was on purpose. Because we're here to worship. And that is all service and connecting time, which is important. But it's all available on the piece of paper. You can grab one out at the connections counter if you don't have one. And it's also available on the website. So you can look it up there as well. God's done great things this week in our lives. You, maybe you're weak and you've said, man, it was a rough week. Look for those great things he's still done. Let's continue to worship him through song. Thank you. 
and I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. You will do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You freed every captive. You break every chain of God. You have done great.
approach the throne in a couple of minutes here. And Harrison's going to come up and pray for us. But I am overwhelmed by this morning of a sense of just brokenness. I feel the Spirit just speaking to me saying, we need to approach His throne and lay down the areas in our life that are just broken. I can go through a laundry list of things that you're dealing with. I can guess, but reality is this. God knows what you're going through. And God loves you so much right where you're at. He doesn't want to abandon that. He doesn't want to ignore that. He wants to have that opportunity to have that discussion with you. He was a God that loves you so much that he's willing to bear your burdens for you. He's willing to hear your brokenness. He wants to know what's on your heart. He wants to know what you're dealing with. He also loves you so much that he's willing to carry those brokenness. He's willing to heal that brokenness for you if you let him. This morning, our altars are open, but we also know that God can meet you right where you're at, and you can take a seat. We know God can meet you right where you're at, right? Right, church? That he's that big. But I will say this. There is something to the action of coming forward to his throne and kneeling before him that is so humbling so enriching, so submitting to the Spirit. And I really believe, church, that we need to be a church that is consistently submitting to God. Consistently saying, your will, not mine. And this morning can be an opportunity for that. You may have some doubts, you may have some frustrations, you may have some things that you're carrying and God wants to hear it and God wants you to know that he's willing to let you lay it down at his altar, his feet, his hands, and he's got them. Are you willing to trust him this morning? So I'm going to ask Harrison to come up and he's going to lead us in prayer, but more importantly, I want you to know this is a time between you and God. To spend this time sharing your heart, sharing, sharing your, your failures, sharing your frustrations, and know God is bigger than them. Harrison, come on up. Let's pray. God, first... We sit here this morning, God, we are here for you. We are here to praise you, God. So first we admit, God, that you are big. God, great are you, Lord. God, despite where, where our hurts are, what we're going through, what we're dealing with, God, allow us to, to lay that before you this morning and God, understand that you are bigger than that. God, that you are more than that. God, that it doesn't matter what we're dealing with. It doesn't matter what we're going through because, God, you have that. You hold that, God, and you take that from us. You take the stress. You take the anxiety, God. You take those hurts. God, I just pray that you would be here this morning. God, as we've already seen you work, as we've already seen you move, God, I just pray you would continue to move. You would continue to work. God, allow us to see you this morning. God, as we take our tithes and our offerings, God, I pray that, that you would be in it, that you would work in it, God, and that uh, we would come to this with the same understanding that, God, you are so much bigger than our finances. You are so much bigger than our money, God. You, you, God, we give you the control over that. So, God, be in that this morning. Be with the rest of this service, God, and just be working and be moving this morning. God, we thank you for all things as we understand that all good things come from you. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen.
Well, welcome. Can you hear me? Is it on? Is it not on? Yeah? No? Yes? Maybe? You can hear me? All right. You just never know. You know, I feel like we like to mute me a lot. It's okay. I think at home they wish I had a mute most of the time. Right? Home? Yep. There we go. All right. Anyway, I just want you to know God is good. No matter what the situation that you find yourself in, it is always easy, I hope, for you to know that God is good. Right? And all the time, God is good. Sometimes it's not a prevalent idea that we can just hold on to. Sometimes that is not the foundation that we think about because our circumstances kind of justify who God is in us. But I want you to know, the circumstances that we live in don't define who God is. Let me repeat that. The circumstances that we find ourselves in do not define who God is. Our life may stink. We may be feeling like there is no tomorrow. We can look out in this world and go, what happened? But God is still the same God as yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He loves us so much that he sent his son not to just tell us what was wrong and right, not to just show us how to live a life. He came to show us that he loves us despite everything of us. He loves us, not because of anything that we can do. We're not the best track stars. We're not the best Bible study years. We're not the best anything. It didn't have to earn it. We didn't have to be the, the gold star of anything. We don't have to have the best Yelp review of life. God loves us. He doesn't look at our reviews of our life and go, well, they're not worth it today. I want you to know that should bring you comfort. Because I... I this is not part of my sermon. This is not part of I just feel the Spirit being led this morning. I just feel like a lot of us, life, life is messy. And there's brokenness. And there's just, we live in a chaotic world. And I'm, telling, I'm not watching the news. I don't know what's new. I know it's just messy, I, right? And it's just easy to be overbearing by this stuff, right? But God is good. And we hold on to that. And we know that. And it fills us up with a joy that this world cannot explain. This world cannot take away. When we draw closer to him, he fills us up with something that this world will never take away. It is a sense of peace in the chaos. It's an understanding that is beyond the understanding and knowledge of this world. And we walk with our heads up because he keeps us up. As long, and this is the key, I think this is a big key, if we draw closer to him, he is nearer to us. And I honestly believe, I hope and I pray, that you have a prayer life that is daily. That you have a prayer life that is in constant communication with God. And guess what? He wants to hear your brokenness. He wants to hear your frustration. He wants to be the ones that... that that will know I'm frustrated with this world, I'm frustrated with life, I'm frustrated with what's going on. He wants to be a part of that discussion. There's a lot of people that don't want to be a part of that discussion with you today, I bet. But God wants that. Your creator, the one that spent the time in knitting you in, his, in your womb, wants to know your interpersonal feelings, your thoughts, your passions, your frustrations, your brokenness. That's our God today. Praise God. All right. The Spirit was led. I had to feel like I did it. And now we're going to talk about where God, I feel like, has been leading me to preach. Um, and, and it's something in which I think uh, that we, we don't really talk about much is biblical leadership, which is really discipleship. Discipleship is one of those things in which, guess what? You are called to be leaders. Not just sideline performers, not just rah, rah, yay. Not just the ones that come and go, okay, I like that and I didn't like that. That song was good. I didn't like that song. I didn't like how we were greeted. I did like how. It's not about your likes. You come here to be trained to go out into a world to share God's love and grace and mercy in this world that needs everything I just said before that we, we know. 
And we have to live that out in this world, right? And so we're going to talk about what it means to be a biblical leader and how, how it looks like in this world, right? Because guess what? You are called to be a leader for Jesus Christ right where you're working today, tomorrow, Monday, Thursday, Friday, wherever you're at. And if it's at home, you are called to be a biblical leader at home. Mom and dad, guess what? You want to be a Christ, a Christ follower, mom and dad. A Christ follower, a husband and wife. A Christ follower that is a single man, a single woman. That is the, the desire of what it means to follow Jesus. It is not just this little pigeonhole that I show up on Sunday morning and I, I, I get, hopefully I'm moved by the Spirit. Hopefully I feel something and I walk away and I'm like, okay, that was, that, I felt the tinglies. And I got moved. And guess what happens? Like, that goes away by Monday in the first, like, conference call. Right? Like, everything you just saw, and you go, oh, God's going to absorb right here. I'm going to take it. And then the first conference, I hate everything. And why do I have to work? Why does this, right? Well, God has given you a purpose. He has. And I don't think some of us believe that or know that or understand that because he's given you a purpose. He's put you on this earth to be a guiding light right where you're at. And he's put people in your lives. He's put situations in your life to show and shine for God above anything else. And you have these choices to either succeed in that or fail in that. Right? Now, like the classroom, if we fail... In the classroom, what happens? What happens, students, if you fail a class? You get to do it again. Not many fail here, so good, that's good. Or they're just looking at me going, I'm not awake, leave me alone, right? Now you're in the spit zone, so I can start spitting, all right? Failures in the world's options, for the most part, is one that we don't really like. We kind of end with failure, right? We kind of move on from it. We kind of go, okay, they're a failure. They're going to live up to these standards for me, and I'm not going to depend on them. I'm not, going to be the, I'm not searching for them to be the ones that I'm going, they failed me once, they failed me twice, psh, done with them, right? Anybody? Just me? Right? God is on the other end of this. He's a God that will take our failures to glorify him. That's scripture, right? Now, does it give you uh, permission to go out, well, I can fail all I want because God's going to use it? No, no, that is not what he wants. But what he's saying is, listen, it is beyond your efforts anyway. I want to use you because I want to be glorified through you. And if you fail, guess what? I'm so much bigger than your failures. All right, that's awesome. I, first off, I want you to know that verse, that understanding, that, that sits here for me because I can stand here knowing no matter what I say, long as I'm trying to do this for God and I fail to deliver, God's going to use it. Now, it doesn't just give me the, the keys to go, well, I can just do whatever I want up here, does it? Because you can go, well, we don't want you anymore. Right? And if I'm directly trying to go against what God is saying and wanting to put on my life just to fail, that is not the spirit in which that is intended. But if I'm trying to do what God has called me to do, and I step in a way that I step in something that I'm like, oh, I didn't mean to say it that way. I didn't mean for it to be come out that way. I didn't mean to lead in that way. And guess what? God goes, listen, I'm, you, are, you are valuable. You, you, cannot, you cannot do this 100%. Nobody is perfect. And I haven't called you to be perfect in the sense of this world. I've called to be perfect because I'm in you, and everything that's in you that is godly is perfect. Because that's who God is, right? The scripture that uh, I want us to, to look at first is this, is Proverbs 4, 7. And this is the scripture in which during this time, I think I will repeat, I will be, uh, rep uh, I want this to to resonate with you during this series, all right? I want it to be something that you're like, man, pastor won't just be quiet about this. Like, it just nonstop with this verse, right? Uh, it is Proverbs 4, 7, wisdom is supreme. I could stop right there. Wisdom is supreme. 
Now, in the world that we live in, knowledge is power, right? I'm going to tell you right now, knowledge is nothing compared to wisdom. But I wonder if we really value wisdom. All right, let me read the, therefore, get wisdom, though it costs all you have, get understanding. It's like a Nike commercial in this verse, right? It's just very, like, plain, get understanding, all right? All right, I'll just take my milk. It's a milk commercial, get milk. Remember that one, all right? Get understanding, get wisdom. First off, you have to ask for it. Right? Knowledge is something in which we look out in this world. It's a vertical thing. It's book. It's, it's more I know if information that I can receive from you, from others, from other human beings of this world. Right? Guess what wisdom comes from? Biblical understanding of what wisdom is, is this, between me and God. I gain wisdom only if I ask from it from God. Now, uh, Proverbs. Do you guys know who wrote Proverbs. Solomon did. Now, do you know he's, he's mentioned as the greatest what? He is the most wise man. Right? God has gifted him with wisdom. Do you know what he probably asked nonstop for daily? Lord, give me wisdom to run this country. Give me the foresight. Not knowledge. Give me the wisdom. I believe it's a daily thing in which we talk about that we need to ask God. When we wake up, when we deal with issues, when we're dealing with the brokenness of this world, when we're having to deal with complications of the life that we live, we should be seeking out God's wisdom and how to handle that. But it comes with the question. It just doesn't come. It has to be sought out. Wisdom is supreme. Therefore, get wisdom. It's not just handed out to you. You have to make a conscious effort to go get it. All right? Uh, This is the idea of biblical leadership that I want us to think about today. I think the number one, very first, most important thing in which we have to understand as, as a biblical leader is you have to be teachable. You have to be somebody that is willing to be taught, somebody that is willing to hear, somebody that is, that is ready with an attitude to receive, right? Those are very, this, this right here can be the cornerstone to a development of a biblical leader within their, their, their own context, their life, the understanding, because wisdom, if we understand it, we receive it, and what it does is change our mind, change our heart, and change how we act, right? It is God coming in saying, hey, listen, there's a better way to do this. There's a better way to act here. There's a better way to slow down and not speak, but listen first. Right? But these are all teachable things. And I want to talk about real quick some things that kind of stand in the way of being teachable. All right? And and, and before I even get further, I want to do a 31 day, I'm I'm doing my challenge up front. All right? First off, you have that sheet, you have the, 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 the sheet with all the information on it. I implore you to take notes today. Not because I think I'm important and I have, I think this is what God has put on my heart to share with you and I think it's all scripture. I love for you to just write down the notes because I, I have a plethora of information. This is why I had to put this here and I'm actually going to preach from this today so I don't veer off and go crazy, which I've already have. All right? So we're looking at noon getting out of here. Ha <laughs> ha! Yeah. Yeah, brother. I will. Right? God is good. Still? All right. All right, all right, good. Just making sure we're still on the same page. All right. Um, I want to do a 31-day challenge with you. Do you know how many chapters in Proverbs? You are so good. All right. 31 chapters are in Proverbs. I implore you, I challenge you, I will do this with you. Every day, read one chapter of Proverbs. It shouldn't take too long. But I think... The more we have Scripture a part of our daily walk, the more that we're doing it together, too, and we're all on the same page in 31 days, who knows what's going to happen. You believe that? Are you willing to take that challenge with me? Yeah? Let's do it, church. 
Let's do 31 days of reading Proverbs today. Just one chapter a day. That's it. If you guarantee, if you say yes right now, all of you at one time say yes, something special will happen. Are we willing to take this challenge? Yes. All right, you're dismissed. <laughs> but God is good, and I, I, I'm excited about this. Tomorrow we start Monday morning. Monday, whenever you're ready to read his scripture, just know that you have a whole church reading that same chapter with you. That we're going through this journey of wisdom, understanding how to live, and it's biblical. Woo! Things are going to start moving, and this, this little church, this church that we have together, right? Man, we're going to start seeing things happening. If you believe in revival, I believe it totally starts with God being centered in our hearts, and we go, okay, Scripture needs to be written all over us. And if we want to see change, if we really want to see revival, guess, guess what is, where it starts? It doesn't start in a service. It starts with us approaching his throne with prayer and in written Scripture. And we go, okay, this is what God has said to me today. How do I live this out? How do I take this phone call where I've got an irate customer and I go, okay, I need to use the wisdom that I just read and I need to be patient, I need to be kind, I need to be God's words and I'm not trying to take advantage of them, I'm not trying to do anything horrible to them, they just need to vent. How do I do that and walk away going, God is good, God is good, right? Right? And the more and the more that we get God's written word in us, guess what voice we actually hear when people are whining, complaining, and frustrated with us, when life isn't doing right, when our, when our spouse is just mad at us and we can't figure it out, when we're just not doing anything right, the voice that we will hear more is what God has written upon us, and we will believe it and know it and, and act on it. And we are not bound to the situations that we are in. We're bound to a God that has loved us and sent his son to die for us. And we find all our value and understanding in this world at that point. All right? So this is the verse in which, write this down, Proverbs 4, 7. Now, it looks different maybe in the NIV, right? Now, there's a little side note. It says, I like this better because it says, it can be said, wisdom is supreme, therefore get wisdom. Otherwise, it says something different, right? Are you looking up Scripture? Now, I implore you to always look up Scripture when I'm doing Scripture. And we're going to have our, our fingers going to be really red today because I have a lot of Scripture to go through. Uh, we have a lot of slides. And what we're going to talk about right now is um, the three things in which hinder us from being teachable, all right? And first, I want to talk about Proverbs 10.8. The wise are glad to be instructed, but babbling fools fall flat on their faces. Sounds mean, doesn't it? I kind of like this verse. I'm, I, I will tell you if um, I felt a call in my life to be a coach first. Now, it says something different from here, doesn't it? The wise of heart accept commands, but the chattering fool comes to ruin it. Right? Listen. There are three things that will, that will enable you to be teachable. All right? And we're going to talk about those, but it starts here. Where do we start? Do we believe that wisdom is derived by God, or do we think we just are innate with all the wisdom that, that we're just, oh. and when I walk in the room, nobody needs to know. I, I've got it all. And in a world that we live in today, too, right? We have every knowledge of bit that we have that we can look up at the tips of our fingers in the palms of our hands and go, well, this is what Google says. You're wrong, right? We live with that confidence. Now, imagine if we had the full confidence and understanding that we believe that God is where wisdom is derived and we are fully embraced with God and we walk out in this world with that wisdom. It's a different kind of wisdom, right? All right. First one, this is what I want you to write down. This is what will hinder you from understanding what it means to be teachable. A know-it-all. Oof. Right? If you're a know-it-all. Now, it is easy for us to start going, well, so-and-so is a know-it-all, and that person's definitely a know-it-all. I want you to know we've all lived in this corner of being a know-it-all. All right? 
And this is the verse in which we would look at. Proverbs 28, 26 says this. Those who trust in themselves are fools. But those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. Listen, it is easy to find ourselves as being people that are know-it-all. I don't need you to tell me how to live my life. I don't need you to be the one that's embracing me and telling me, hey, you're going the wrong way. But in reality, it is easy to go, man, I got this, right? And we live, if you look at church today, I would say we perform more of this than the other. And why I say that as a pastor is I can see us living our spiritual life alone. And we don't want people to come to us and guide us and direct us. So we know it all. I've got it. I, I love quizzers. And this isn't a sound like I don't. I love biblical quizzers. I love that they know the scripture. I love that they got it beat down in their life and that they, they can answer a question. If you've ever gone to a quiz meet for teens or kids, it's amazing, right? They can say two or three words in this, uh, a question, just a question, and they stand up and they have to finish the question and then they have to get the verse and they have to give the, the reasoning for it and they have to give all these things. And I'm like, where did that come from? They just said, what the, Right? Now, that sounds like my version of what the can be so much different from theirs. But they're answering the question verbatim, and they get it right, and I'm like, Lord, I'm missing it. But this is what I want to say that the problem with quizzing is, is they have all that scripture, and all of a sudden they become the know-it-alls. And if anybody comes to them, they just spit out the information, and it has not resonated with them in the way that wisdom has. Like it hasn't transformed them. It hasn't adapted their life to it. And when they're approached with that, they go, well, I know it. Leave me alone. I've got this. So those who trust in themselves are fools. These are mean kind of words. I'm loving it. My heart needs to change, I know. But those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. And if we know what wisdom, the source of wisdom is this morning, it's God. We are safe in him. Right? Second thing. Second thing to write down that will keep us from being um, teachable. Been there, done that. Been there, done that. Right? Let me show you. The Proverbs 1.5 says this. Let the wise listen and add to their learning. And let the discerning get guidance. Right? Those who have been there and done that, when you're trying to explain, when God's trying to explain, hey, that's not the way to live. Oh, I've been there. I've done that. It's not going to work. You understand that? Like, we, we have, have you ever had those moments where you're talking to somebody and you're like trying to give you advice or just telling you something? And you're like, no, I've done that. It didn't work for me. Never again would I do that again. You ever been there? I have. Right? Been there, done that. That's not how wisdom works. If, if it's called to go at a certain situation again, and maybe even use the same techniques again, guess what? God is speaking to you. He's giving you another opportunity to shine. He's giving you another opportunity to share his word in a situation that the other person might approach it differently. The situation might change Right? You might be the same person, but the situation might change. And if you approach it the same way that God has called you to approach it, guess what? Well, di the difference is the interactions might be different. Been there, done that, doesn't work. It, it causes us not to be teachable. Third thing, the one upper. One upper, right? Proverbs 11:2. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. All right, with, with the one upper, have you ever had this conversation and you're telling a story and you can tell the other person's not there really listening? They just are waiting to come in and go, well, <laughs> yeah, but I did this, this, and this, right? The reality there is this. You may be explaining something. You may have like, been bestowing some wisdom there on that person. But they are already, they, they, they're already checked out. They're already checked out. They have their story. 
And the, the one upper wants to let you know, hey, I've got a better one. I want you to know, like I, since I've been studying this, have, I have caught myself so many times in this predicament. Where I'm like, well, I hear that. I have this. And it's like taking the stair step up, trying to beat theirs. Right? And it's not about them. It's about me trying to prove that I'm something. Trying to prove that I've got this. Trying to prove I don't need what they are giving me. In all reality, I'm just becoming unteachable. All right? So let me repeat those things. We have first the know-it-all. We have been there, done that. We have the one-upper. Right? And we have now, I want to tell you the things in which that will, will change, that lead to a different kind of spirit and what a teachable spirit looks like. It's one of humility. Pride is the downfall of wisdom. Do you know that? Pride is the downfall of of having wisdom. It's when we think we've got it and we don't need anything else that it kicks us in the rear. Proverbs 4, 7 says this, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom though it costs all we have. Get understanding, right? Right? Proverbs 27, 17 says, as our iron sharpens iron, to the one person sharpens another. Okay, right here. You know what we need? We need other people in our lives to sharpen us. Do you know what that takes? Us being humble. And I, I heard a quote from another pastor put it this way. I feel like we have a lot of butter knives. That wouldn't cut meat for anything because we're either scared to approach each other in a ways or we're not ready to take it right and and I want to say this too I don't think you want ever to have somebody to have a critical heart towards you I don't think we're called to be critical of each other I think we're called to coach each other up There's a whole different mentality with that in how you approach the relationship with the other person. If you come ready to tear them down and tell them how they're not living right and how they're not doing it right and how they're not being right, guess what they don't want? They won't want that relationship with you. Now, this is in the context of church. You know what's even more prevalent out in the real world? That. You know what the world needs and the church needs is a bunch of people willing to lift each other up and go, listen, I see this about you and I see some great potential out of you and it would be awesome if you stepped up in these areas. And guess what? God needs you to be this way. God wants you to live this way. Why? Because, man, once you go down this path of life, it is rough, it is not easy, and it's not glorifying God, and it's not leading you in a life of healthiness. It leads you in a life of loneliness. Well, you may have all the friends in the world, but in reality, you are truly lonely if you don't have God sitting at the throne of your life. Because only God truly knows who you are. What your motives are. What your desires are. Right? Iron sharpens iron. And when we do this, we do it in the name of God, and we do it out of grace, and we do it out of love, and we do it out in a way that it is tough. It is not easy. I think about those who are, if you ever watched Forge by Fire, right? That show that you build knives, you build weapons. It's a a guy show, I guess. I I love it. It's kind of interesting. You see things sliced and diced, and whether it will make it or not, right? And and it's weapons, and, and it's gruesome. I'm feeling it as I'm talking about it, right? I would love for us to be a church that does that with each other. That when we walk out here, we're warriors for God, sharpened by his word. Coached up, knowing that he can, we can do anything in his name and really believe it. 
That marriages can be redeemed because we believe it, because we've been sharpened that way. That relationships can be redeemed because we believe it, because we've been sharpened that way. That I can quit my addictions because I believe it and I've been sharpened that way. But when we, we just play the dance, when we're nervous about touching swords, when we're nervous about ironing each other, all we're going to get is butter knives. And we're just going to stand around going, well, there is no meat in my life, and I'll just have some vegetables and butter. And I, if you're a vegan, good luck to you. I want some meat. And God calls his word meat. He calls it the bread of life. He calls it those things. And if we're willing to eat more of the, what he's desiring of us, guess what? We are going to have a bigger meal each time we come up ready to be ready at that table. But if we only have a butter knife, we're not going to be able to chop up what he's got for us. And it's not going to taste good. And it's going to hurt. And we're just going to push that plate aside. Listen, church, we are called to be not individuals here. We're called to be part of a body of believers that is moving forward for God. And what that means and what that looks like is we confront each other. Not out of criticism, but out of coaching. Not out of a spirit of like, that is mean, but it is out of a spirit of grace and mercy. And if I see you, live in, if I see you walk out of here today, just, just a horrible spirit, and I go, well, God be with them. <laughs> and I don't approach it. That's on me. That's on us. We are called to love each other. And the way that God sent His Son to love us, there's a cost to it. And it's not easy, and it hurts sometimes. Sharpening knives, it takes the filters off. It takes the pain off. It makes it sharp. But that sharpening, is there's a cost to it. And there's a cost to us sharpening each other. We've got to get beyond the bounds of being, "Ah, I just want this to be a safe place. No. This needs to be the preparation for us to go to war. Right? In a war that is one that's already been won, a war that is not of the same weapons of this earth. It is weapons of love. It is weapons of grace. It is weapons of patience. It is weapons of kindness. It is weapons of those, those things in which God goes, hey, if you love your enemy, guess what that's like? That's like burning hot keep coals on their head. If you're graceful, it will change somebody for eternity. But we can't do that if we're not teachable. Right? All right. Next thing, Proverbs 12.1 says this, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. I'm sorry if you have kids in here. I know that's a word that we're not allowed to really say in our household, right, Michelle? That's right. But Scripture says it, so I'm going to say it this morning. All right? Proverbs 12.1, I'm going to say it again. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. Right? Listen, it, to be teachable, you have to be one that is willing to be disciplined. And there's no end to this. There's not a date like, at, you know, at age 55, I don't have to be disciplined anymore. Right? Is there an age limit on this? No. Right? It, 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 growth means it's for life. Right? Listen, we have, I, what I love right now in our church is we have, I, we have a couple of classrooms that are filled with people. That We have a Genesis class that Lisa DeClue teaches, and it's awesome. We also have a Generations class that is led by uh, Harrison and, and Dave, right? And, and in that class, I'm going to brag on that class a little bit, and it's nothing to take away from the Genesis class. They have multi-generations in there too, right? But in that class, uh, what, what Harrison's and uh, Dave's class is really providing is this opportunity of all generations to come together, and they pose one question, and they come together and share the wisdom from all avenues of life. So our older generation, is guess what they're learning? They're learning from the different perspective of the younger generation. What the younger generation is hearing is the, new, the old generation's perspective of how life was. 
and how it is and how it should be in some ways. And they, there's, there's this growth that is so amazing. And I want, you, I want you to know, I hear Dave's story and I hear Harrison tell the story and I've heard others talk about this class and it's been great. Now it's take, it, taken its time and there's people like, I don't know if I like this, I don't know, because it puts them out there to share what their feelings are about this topic. Like hell. They talked about hell, right? Yeah. Can you imagine hearing a junior high's version of hell? And then a grandpa's version of hell? Do you think they're the same? Do you think it's healthy that each side hears that? Absolutely. But if I had a grandpa in there that didn't hear, like, was like, heard what the junior higher said, and it was like, Psh, whatever, that's not hell, and just totally was flippant about that, that is not healthy. That is not good, right? It's always being willing to allow God to use whatever avenue God wants to use to share with you his wisdom and his understanding of Scripture and understanding of life, and he will paint a new picture every day if you allow him. Because God is so big, there is no way we can truly embrace everything that God is. There's just no way. But can you imagine the journey it is to want that, to be a part of that, to have that in me, to go, man, I'm excited about what's new today because of what God is going to show me today because I just want to be a part of this. Proverbs 13, 13 through 14 says this, whoever scorns instruction will pay it, will pay for it, but whoever respects the command is rewarded. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life turning a person from the snares of death. There's another way to read it. People who despise advice are, ask, are asking for trouble. Let me read that again. People who despise advice are asking for trouble. Those who... All right. I believe we are called to correct each other. We are called to sharpen iron what's an iron. But one of the verses in which, one of the parts in this I think that we need to really focus on when we're doing this is becoming a fountain of life. When you become a fountain of life, it doesn't sound treacherous. It doesn't sound something that you're like, I'm going to stay away from that fountain. That's evil. Right? A fountain of life sounds amazing. It sounds like something you want to go to, something you want to be a part of, maybe even swim in, something that you're like, you want to be embraced with, right? Can you imagine people talking about you and going, man, they're just a fountain of life, a fountain of joy, a fountain of something that is just amazing. You don't really hear a fountain of horribleness, right? That just doesn't go along with the fountain. A fountain is something that is life bringing, life ensuring, life breathing, right? Proverbs says, if you are willing to correct somebody, you do it with a fountain of life. You bring life to them. Understand this. Listen. The theologically, we are born into death. We are born into sin. And a lot of people don't understand that, believe that, or are are just naive to it. When we, under, when we encounter God, we come to this encounter of realizing we are born into death and the only way we can live is knowing that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior and we have this new life that we can breathe, right? And all that was, Ben Alexander, is now Jesus Christ, Ben Alexander. Understand that? I have a new life in him and I can breathe and all the things in which I am flow from that. 
And this is where this fountain comes from. This is where I bring this, this joy of life. And guess what? It, it is not one that is coming to people heaping conviction. It is one heaping correction. Get that? It's, guess who does the convicting? Is it us? It's God. We just did the judgy, right? We just did the judgy. We just learned God does all the convicting. But you know, we get to be a part of the correcting. Right? And that is one that we do with the fountain of life. And that is one that we bring forth by people with love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness. There's a difference when we do it this way. Right? And we have to be teachable in that. Because guess what? In every interaction, it's different. In every interaction that we have with people is different. And we have to be teachable and malleable. Right? James 1 says this. There's three things. So I just gave you the three things that, that, that are the opposite of the, the know-it-all. Been there, done that. Um, what was the third one? The one-upper. Ha, ah, you just one-upped me. Set you up. All right? All right. So how do we live this out? How do we do this? Well, first I want to tell you in James 1 it says this. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. Ask for it. Guess what? God desires a relationship with you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Now, back in the day, during Jesus' time, belief looked different from our belief. Because if, if I believed it back then, guess what? It also transformed everything that I did. I acted on it. So, do you believe that God can still heal today? Do you pray for it? Good. Do you pray for it daily? Good. Awesome. You're awesome. But the numbers dwindled. <laughs> right? Listen, if we believe it, we act on it. Can you imagine every day when you start the morning, Lord, if I lack wisdom, give me wisdom. Imagine starting your day that way. And how it transforms how you interact that day with people. How you interact with yourself and how you're tempted with certain things and how you deal with it, right? If I'm lacking wisdom, Lord, give me wisdom. Man, that's awesome. There's a way to pray this. I, I, I truly believe that. Let me look at it. I want to get it right. Um, I thought I had it written down. <laughs> See, all right, I'll find it. Well, maybe. Oh, okay, this is what I, I think we should be praying every day. Give me wisdom that's beyond my years and beyond my experiences. Let me say that again. Please write this down because this, I wrote it down and I do think it's really important and I really want to add this part of my journey, especially thir for the 31 days. If I'm going to pray this, I want to pray it this way. Lord, give me, experience, give me wisdom that is beyond my years and beyond my experience. All right. All right. Second thing, accept, accept, accept responsibility. James uh, three seventeen says this. But the wisdom that comes from heaven, first of all, is pure, then peace loving and considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial and sincere. The word I would love for us to focus on that I think we struggle with is the submissive part. If we're going to be submissive to his, his, his wisdom, guess what we have to take part in? We have to take part in the part where we were not wise. We have to be absolutely true in the areas of our life that we are not wise. All right? Third thing. Apply what you learn. Man, James is so blatant. This is what I love about James. James. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Pretty simple, right? God, God wants to, he's telling you something. He's putting wisdom in your life. Don't just go, man, that was a great little thing that I heard. I loved that. That was, that was wonderful. That lifted my spirit. And then just not have any part of it for the rest of the week. If he's telling you to be patient with somebody, 
that needs to be patient, that's in your life, that won't be there, won't listen to you, doesn't want any part of you, it keeps being around you in your life, guess what? Be patient. If he's giving you that nugget, and he's telling you to do these things, do them. Apply it to your life. If you hear, okay, you've heard a hundred better sermons than this this morning. You've heard a hundred better sermons by different pastors. Do you do everything that they have said? Have you applied it to your life today? Is it still ingrained? Has it become another muscle? Has it become something in which you do it and you're like, I I don't even realize I do it now because, you know, I wake up and I'm like, I pray for wisdom every day, every moment because I need it. I know I lack it and I want it and it needs to be enriched in me and it's part of who I am. Or is this something that you walk out, man, that was a good sermon, I loved it, but is it going to be a practice? You see, it's not upon your pastor to live out your spiritual walk. Guess whose responsibility that is? It is yours alone. It is ours to come along and say, hey, I see you not living this out. Like, can I help you? Can I, be a heart? can I encourage you? Can I coach you up? Man, if you spend, another, like, just wake up five minutes earlier, you'll get that scripture time. You'll get that God time. Don't, have, don't, don't talk to anybody in the morning before you talk to God. Imagine starting your day off with that, going, listen, I don't have time for you because I need God before I can interact with you. Some of us, that might save people's lives. Right? Think about that. I might be able, because I'm acting on what I have been told, what I have read, what God has put in my life, the wisdom that he has bestowed upon me, and I'm acting on it, salvation might be reached through me because of what God is doing through me. And I'm using it. I'm embracing it. And it's becoming a part of me. Three things that will help you. All right? Ask for it. Accept responsibility. Apply what you learn. Proverbs 19.20 is what I'm going to leave you with this morning. I know I've gone a little long. I'm sorry. But Proverbs 19.20 says this. Listen to advice. Accept discipline. And at the end, you will be counted among the wise. I know, I know as, a, as a youth pastor, uh, one of the things I enjoyed about youth ministry is I could be a fool. And they would, they would enjoy that. As a senior pastor, not so much. Right? Now, we might get a laugh or two, but you don't want a foolish pastor. You probably want somebody that's going to have some wise words, some things that you go, okay, I can take that with me. Right? Guess what? I think we all have that desire in us that when we walk away from a relationship, it is not one that we walk away going, that was a fool. We want to walk away knowing, man, God used me in that moment. And I said yes to him. And all the things that he had been storing up in me, it came out. I want you to know, the best moments in my life have been the moments that I've been able to share the salvation with somebody that has sat down and talked with me and asked me certain questions. And I just started spilling out everything that God had done in my life. And it wasn't about Ben Alexander, but I, I was able to express what I have learned and how, what I am still learning today. And in that moment, God moved. And he used his wisdom through me. So my question for you as you leave this morning, are you going to be teachable? pretty simple. Can you stop being a know-it-all? Can you stop? Been there, done that. Can you stop being a one-upper? Can you sit those to the side, let them be off the, and, and when you're having a conversation with somebody, you invest in that moment and allow God to use you. Allow God to embrace you in that moment. 
And most of the time, wisdom comes with our mouth shut and our ears open. And we're ready to hear. Stand with me, church. Let's pray. Generally, Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the, the opportunity to, to be a part of your word, to be a part of your church body. I pray that we, we are not a church of butter knives, that we are a church that is ready to sharpen each other. Lord, may we do it out of love and grace. May we do it out of one that is uh, coaching and not convicting. May we be here to, to embrace each other. May we go out into this world and allow you to che- teach us and mold us, and may we share the wisdom that you have bestowed upon us. Lord, teach us to be teachable. We give you all the praise this morning. Help us be the church you called us to be in this world. Amen. You're dismissed.